Okay, um, so I'm glad to have you all in here virtually as usual in these times, and especially Martin Zandbu from London, uh, also from home office, um, as he told us a minute ago. Um, very happy to have you. As Martin has uh, already followed our experience, our uh, endeavor in recent, in former times, I remember this excellent dinner. Uh, session that we had where Mariana Matsukato was supposed to be and then he had she had to go to the dentist and uh, in the end did a audio in uh, intervention which was excellent and you moderated the session I, I remember that was in the end fantastic and Mariana is uh, able to do this even if she's not present as as if she were present so that's uh, I'm reminding that uh, the discussion with you and the, uh, the uh, chairing this session was excellent. So you know about our um, uh, initiative and uh, people, I don't think we don't need to introduce you um, very much uh, because uh, a lot of people know you as the uh, writer of this very ambitious and very excellent uh, free lunch um, column in, in the FT and also as the economics European economics uh, commentator uh, at the FT. And just to mention, you've done studies, uh, research at uh, uh, excellent uh, universities like Harvard, Columbia, and so on. And you've published already two books before the la last one last year. And this is the one we would like to talk about because it's covering mainly the topics that we want to cover and the, has the same ambition. So not only to cover some specific challenges and find solutions to some specific challenges, but to find an overall new answer to policymaking, economic policymaking and a new paradigm. And that's what you did in that book, in that excellent book that we are happy to see you now to present. And all the more that um, in these days, there are uh, suddenly a lot of discussions, a lot of debates around the, the question, if the new US president, Joe Biden, uh, a little bit surprisingly, given what he was supposed to be at the beginning, may be the one to introduce a, a sort of a radical new plan for economic uh, policies and society. Uh, with what he's done already and what is now coming up as a second step. So the first one just uh, adopted with the 1.9 billion, a trillion dollar rescue package. And then another one, which, which is supposed to be around 3 trillion US dollars as was uh, what we could read in the newspapers now. So it's perfect as you all also follow this and have already commented it to join, of, to bring these two questions together, to bring your views together with a comment and a discussion on what uh, has been decided or is to be decided by Joe Biden and um, the new administration. So i um, very happy um, to have you. And I would like to invite you first to give us an insight uh, on the content, the content and the topic of your books, uh, the main ideas. And then we will have a certainly very lively de debate on, on your book and the implications and the US perspectives. So many thanks, Martin, go ahead. Uh, thanks to you, Thomas, and to everyone for having me. Uh, es tut mir leid, dass ich das nicht auf Deutsch uh, tun kann. If I was going to do it in German, I would have to script everything out and it would take too long. I'm also sad that I can't be with you in person, but you know, that memory of, uh, of Mariana Matsukato's event was, now that I think back about it, it was a wonderful meeting, but it was a sign of things to come where we proved that it was actually possible to do these things remotely. Those, those of us who do the kinds of things that can be done remotely, which is a big part of what this is all about, um, uh, as you'll see. I mean, let me first tell you that I, I finished the book pretty much when COVID was hitting. I remember kind of doing final corrections on the uh, uh, on the manuscript or already on the proofs when it was kind of crossing from China to, to Europe and the US. Um, so it was, it was just too late to incorporate anything. But uh, my own sense is that all the processes that are already underway that I write about have just become all the more relevant with the pandemic. But, but that's something we can discuss. Uh, 
so, so I want to just give everyone a, a quick overview of what's in the book, and it's really in two parts. Um, and it was prompted, uh, this whole idea of belonging and the economics of belonging was prompted in, in me by my reaction or my attempt to make sense of these big political shocks we've had in the West, especially, of course, the 2016, the Trump election and the Brexit referendum, but this rise of anti-liberal, anti-system uh, populism in pretty much every Western country. Um, this backlash against an economic and social order that I kind of grew up in the triumph of, if you like. Um, so, so my generation were the ones who sort of saw communism topple, capitalism triumphant, new world order, all of these things in the 90s. Uh, and as we all know, it didn't last very long and everyone was disenchanted. So uh, that the book comes out of that very common shock, right? Um, what I tried to do was to as far as I could, try to understand the support for these kinds of movements. Uh, and and I, the more I look, the more I'm convinced that it really has economic roots, even though it often has a cultural or value-driven, values-driven uh, expression. So the first part of the book is, is called What Went Wrong, and it, it really tries to chronicle uh, the economic changes in Western economies over the last 40 years, pretty much. Uh, but I think in a way that isn't the most common way. So I make two principal arguments. One is that the, the backlash against the liberal social and economic order really is grounded in economics, that there are people who have reasons to be angry, economic reasons to be angry, that the anger is, you know, there's a reason for it. And, and I map out some of these changes, you know, we know some of them inequality has increased, but I think we don't always know all the dimensions in which these uh, inequalities have increased. So I emphasize that it's not just income inequality, it's also wealth inequality, it's inequality between the regions within countries. For the first 30 years after the war, every Western country saw different parts of the country converge, poorer regions catching up with richer ones that stopped, stagnated, sometimes went into reverse after 1980. Um, so the importance of place, I think, is crucial and the sense that some places are no longer part of, of the deal. They're not long, no longer, um, the economy isn't really longer, any longer working for them. Uh, the other argument I make in this first part is that all these changes which have left a certain group of people particularly vulnerable, namely the people who would formerly have gone into industrial jobs, which uh, has, have disappeared everywhere, that has economic roots, but the, the, the causes aren't globalization, hardly at all. Maybe on the margin globalization has made a difference, but I basically say, look, the industrial jobs would have disappeared anyway. And, you know, if people want to, we can go into the details of why that is. Briefly, it started before globalization took off in earnest. Um, industrial jobs have often disappeared in industries where production has just continued to increase. So my favorite example is that you look at the U.S. car industry, you know, employment in U.S. car manufacturing has fallen for the last 40 years. Production has just continued to increase. The U.S. produces more cars than pretty much ever up and down with recessions, but the trend has been going up. Uh, so that isn't that production disappeared, it's that production didn't need people anymore. And that's the definition of productivity. So really, it's mostly, I think, uh, a change in the structure of how we produce things, increased automation, technological change in manufacturing, which means that we just don't need many hands in factories anymore. Instead, the most highly value added dominant sectors are in the knowledge services, and those industries tend to benefit different kinds of people in different places than before. That, in a nutshell, is, is the story of the last 40 years of Western economies. And I think the politics have largely followed uh, those economic upheavals. Uh, then the bigger question, of course, and this is the main part of the book, what do we do about it? Um, and, and so I think it's important for people who identify themselves as, as liberals or, or centrists, um, to, to first uh, defend globalization in the sense of saying it's not globalization that has caused this, but there are problems we need to solve. We don't solve them by ending globalization. Uh, so part of the point in the book here is not to give too much to the anti-globalization 
populist forces because there are a lot of people, sort of good liberals, I often have discussions with my friend Danny Roderick about this, also think globalization has gone too far. I don't think globalization has gone too far. I think we made a lot of mistakes in national policy. Um, but if it's the case that it's basically uh, increased productivity in certain sectors that have driven these deep economic changes, then that's not something we want to stop. It's something we need to find a way to embrace. We want automation. We want more machines, more capitals, AI, more capital, more computers, anything that can make labor more productive. But we want to do that in a way that actually creates good jobs for as many people as possible across national territories. So, you know, that I think is a statement of what the goal has to be. And then the very difficult question is, what do we do to get there? Uh, well, I have a, a list of chapters that, that address different areas in economic policy, labor markets, redistribution, uh, tax policy, macroeconomic policy, regional policy, financial markets policy. Uh, but before, you know, I'll go very quickly through some of them, but one big message is that it's actually easier, I think, to do a lot of these things at once in a big reformist package than to try incremental change one thing at a time. And this, I think, points to the question of whether Biden is getting it right. It might actually be easier to change things if you go big than if you go small or step by step. Um, you know, let me sp say a little bit about the labor market because I think uh, it's where we really see what's gone wrong and what needs to be fixed. In pretty much every Western country, we've seen the labor market bifurcate, divide into, you know, those with good jobs and those with bad jobs. And it's quite striking that this is true in the very unregulated, the Anglo-American labor markets. And it's true in the very regulated, you know, South European, basically, labor markets. In both, you've managed to create a large precariat, a large group of people who have bad jobs, badly paid jobs, insecure jobs, unpredictable uh, shifts, and so on, and all the costs that come with that, including the costs in in productivity, just, you know, it, it's impractical to try to string together a lot of small insecure jobs. The gig economy is part of this, but it's, it's only part of it. Uh, Germany, although most of you will know more about the German economy than I do, but Germany strikes me as having shifted from one of those bad models to the other bad model. Uh, but you still have a problem with the precariat in, uh, in Germany. Uh, the economies that have done best in avoiding this are the Nordic economies. Um, and what they have managed to do right is not to try to stop the, uh, uh, the change in the economic structure that makes all jobs unviable. They have embraced it. So you have much, uh, you, you have a combination of higher wages at the low end with a higher adoption of capital automation, productivity enhancing practices that in return then makes it possible for businesses to pay more. That's the kind of good equilibrium you've got in the Nordics. And that's what I think other countries need to try to uh, strive for in their ways. You can't do it in the same way as the Nordics because that's rooted in a particular history, institutional history of collective bargaining. But you can do it, I think, by first uh, actually choosing to let unproductive jobs be competed away. So one thing you can do is to have fairly aggressive minimum wage policy uh, that would make it unviable to choose business models that rely on employing a lot of low productive labor. You obviously want to, uh, to train, to spend enough money both on reallocating labor to better jobs, active labor market policies, and to train and equip people for more advanced, more productive jobs. And you want to ensure that those new jobs actually appear. That links to macroeconomic policy. Um, macroeconomic policy, I think, and th this is probably a particularly contested point in parts of Germany, macroeconomic policy has been far too timid, even in this last decade with extraordinary monetary policy. Um, I think if we look at the recovery from the financial crisis in pretty much every country, it's been too slow and it's been too slow because demand hasn't grown fast enough. Mm. Uh, the time to get back to the level of employment 
or employment to population ratios that you could have had has been far too slow. And when you look back over a number of decades, you find that timid macroeconomic policy that pushes the brakes when you start to approach something you think may be the equilibrium rate, the natural rate of unemployment, it doesn't affect people equally. It tends to affect the people who are already at the bottom. So you find people in minorities, often women, the young certainly, and especially those with low formal education, they are always the ones who get hired for, uh, fired first in a recession, and it turns out they get hired last in a recovery. So the way we have tended to do macroeconomic policy guided by the average of the economy, by aggregate numbers, is actually deeply biased in an unfair way. So I argue in the book that both for fairness reasons, but also for productivity reasons, we want to have a much more aggressive uh, macroeconomic policy. So this, in a sense, is really going back to Keynes, who used to say uh, the, the goal has to be to try to stay in a permanent semi-boom rather than try to moderate the business cycle through occasional higher interest rates to puncture the booms. Um, those are kind of two big elements uh, directing the labor market towards high productivity jobs and therefore well-paid jobs and directing macroeconomic economic policy towards high demand growth, that's kind of at the core uh, of what I think needs to be done and can be done in the short run. But there's a lot of other structural things around that um, that is needed. So I'll just rattle through them so you have a sense of, of the list, if you like. Uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, financing, uh, we need to have systems that are more based on equity finance or equity type finance, where the investor takes risk and less on debt finance. Uh, debt tends to be too much debt tends to put investments into the wrong kinds of things, things that don't lead to high productivity growth, uh, whereas equity style investments are more uh, useful for you know, startups, uh, pro productive business investment and so on. Uh, so I think not that we need less financing, but that we need more equity and less debt. Um, in terms of tax policy, we have found over the last 40 years as a result of these structural changes that national income uh, has shifted in many places from labor to capital, but the tax take hasn't shifted correspondingly. We also know in every country that the size of wealth of you know, the capital stock, if you like, the value of the capital stock compared to national income has risen enormously, pretty much doubled everywhere in the last generation. And yet the tax take from wealth, in terms of wealth taxes, hasn't gone up at all. In fact, most countries that had wealth taxes have got rid of them. So I propose that we try to, in order to uh, Im improve a productivity enhancing flow in the labor market, we shift some burden from labor to especially wealth, wealth taxes, uh, and also taxes on carbon. We'll talk about climate if you want to, but there are tax reforms to be had. Uh, finally, and I just mentioned this as the worst, the most difficult of the problems, uh, we need to really have a policy that tries to spread the most modern jobs more evenly across the national territory. So regional policies that make it viable for the highest paid jobs uh, to be in more places than just the big cities. Th this is something actually I think Germany does better than many countries. Uh, but we've seen the same tendency everywhere that basically the capital cities or the biggest cities uh, move ahead and smaller places and rural areas fall behind. We can talk about how, how we need to think about that if you want. I, I want to stop now so we have time for discussion. Um, but just on that last point, I think the pandemic may have created some new opportunities because we've found now that precisely these types of jobs can actually be done from anywhere. Uh, we're in a very fertile place for policymakers to think, well, what are the political incentives and economic incentives we can put in place in order to, once we get out of the pandemic, use this technological leap we've all been part of to try to spread out these industries that naturally cluster in the biggest cities in order precisely 
to have some more of them spread in the areas that are currently being left behind. I'll stop there. Uh, that, that's a lot, but uh, if you're interested, please read the book, but I, I would love to now discuss your reactions and your questions. Yeah, excellent. Uh, many thanks. And um, just to recall, uh, the, the book uh, is uh, just on the left of your head. Uh, if someone wants to have a look uh, on how it looks like, the economics of belonging. So if you want to check out and, and uh, find it on, uh, on the web. Um, I, I would, would very much like to, to ask you one question to, to start on the diagnosis. What is for you the common has been the common driver of, of, of what you see as something which is uh, really uh, not only in one country, but in many countries. As you described, it's different in, in, in the US and Europe and sometimes, but it seems as you describe it as if there's something common. What is it? What has been the common driver behind? Look, I think, I think what every Western country has in common is the decline in factory employment. In every Western country, the absolute number of factory jobs peaked around 1980, plus minus five years. The share, of course, was falling throughout uh, the second half of the 20th century, but, but the absolute number peaked pretty much in 1980. That's one reason why I think it's not really globalization, because globalization, as we know it, it really kind of started in the late 80s. Um, but that, I think, is crucial because... Other jobs, of course, took their place. Uh, it's not as if there are fewer jobs, except in the US where things are a bit special. Uh, but in most countries, more people are employed now than then, but in different work. What really uh, is important is that the kinds of jobs that are created now give advantages to different types of people than they did, than the industrial economy did. Mm -hmm. And I think you see it especially at the level of place. I mean, you think about the, the optimal scale of the factory economy is sort of the factory, right? So a small town is big enough, a medium-sized town is big enough to be a manufacturing center. Mm -hmm. That's not true of the very uh, high value added knowledge services that lead the economy today. They tend to thrive on the more people you have together in kind of a big creative confusion where everything can change, where people can shift jobs all the time, where ideas spark. That's something that really works best in urban environments, very dense urban environments. Uh, so that's one big difference. Another big difference is what sort of uh, training, of course, educational background is advantage now. It's You get much more out of being a a college trained person now or rather you have bigger disadvantages of not being it now than before also again because to the extent that there are industrial jobs they're also quite skill intensive uh, and because of those things actually different even different sort of personality types and attitudes and outlooks on on life have different economic rewards than they used to have. So you get more reward now relative to the before for being the sort of person who embraces change, who's happy to move, who is not so rooted in the place they grew up, um, who will move to the city, right? Who embraces diversity, change, difference, newness, um, which, you know, you may or may not have those attitudes. But I think the way the economy has changed there's an economic status or reward that comes with those attitudes that wasn't so much the case before. And I think once we talk about it that way, we see how different parts of the population have drifted apart in economic ways, in sociological ways, and of course, ultimately in political ways. Yeah, sure. Um, very interesting. I would, um, we have asked uh, a colleague, uh, Robert uh, Gold, uh, to join and to, uh, for a very specific reason, because Robert is uh, working on a paper for us and has already done some work for us on the reasons and on the drives of, uh, for populism. So uh, touching the first part of your diagnosis, and I would very much like to invite Robert to just share some thoughts spontaneously on uh, what you perceive as uh, the main point or maybe also different points to make on, on this um, diagnosis. So Robert, do you... 
Yeah, excellent. Let me start with uh, thanking uh, Martin. Thank you a lot, uh, Martin, for this uh, very interesting talk, nicely summarizing uh, the main uh, findings and arguments of uh, your book. Um, let me quickly summarize my understanding uh, of uh, what you just said and what you've written. And that is that in the end, uh, you say that the core root for the dissatisfaction many people have with the current economic and political system that the core root is inequalities in different dimensions. There's wealth inequality, income inequality, regional inequalities, and that these inequalities in turn, or, uh, these, these uh, inequalities are uh, mainly um, driven by uh, economic uh, factors. And um, I think that's, that's a very compelling argument. And what I like a lot is that you do not look at, uh, at, at single influences in isolation, as uh, Thomas said, but that you try to uh, combine them and even link the economic uh, factors to, to uh, psychological factors. So uh, it's not only the economic hardship that uh, you face, but it's also this this uh, loss of feeling to belong to the whole system that's uh, driving uh, the point. And on the basis of that, you develop a very ambitious uh, policy uh, program to tackle the root causes uh, of the problem, and that is uh, the inequalities. And if I get you right, at the core of the policy program is to equip people to find a better jobs in, in uh, the very end, to educate people, to, to uh, make institutional reforms, to incentivize uh, public uh, demand in order to uh, allow people that are now left behind to find better paid jobs with better perspectives to uh, participate more fully in uh, the economy uh, again. And also here, uh, what I like a lot is that you, um, you think of, of uh, interaction between these policies. It's a policy system in the very end. It's not, uh, we have to introduce a minimum wage. It is, if you want to introduce minimum wage, you also have to educate people and you also have to increase uh, public demand. Um, let me ask two or three questions. So the strong focus on education and skill upgrading, of course, rests on your conclusion that technological change is the main driver of all these uh, inequalities. And, um, and in relation to that, other economic uh, developments um, matter less. I don't want to make an argument uh, if it is the one economic channel or if it is the other economic channel or what's most important. What I did not really understand is technological change in the end is an ever ongoing process. So we have had technological change for 200 years uh, or so uh, right now. But this strong increase in inequalities, as you showed, that's a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. And, and my reading of the literature is indeed that this should relate with uh, economic, uh, other economic influences that uh, occurred more recently. So uh, globalization, uh, for instance, it's difficult to think technological change as being independent of globalization. Globalization increases the pressure in industrialized countries to shift from labor to capital. And this is, of course, facilitated by technological change. And I find it difficult to disentangle the two. And specifically, if you think about this, this discontent with globalization, I always had this, this Roderick argument in mind. Why do people suddenly um, oppose uh, the liberal market economy? Why do they vote for, for the protectionist parties? And Roderick makes this argument that it also relates to fairness. And, and, and he has a strong argument that it is, should be more centered on globalization and not so much on technological change because people are familiar with technological change. They know what happens and they know how to deal with it. They, they've been observing technological change for 100 years and they know that uh, if automation goes on, they have to invest into their skills and then they might, might find different uh, jobs and in the end, it's okay for them. They regard it to be fair. Whilst they regard um, globalization to be unfair because you suddenly lose your job because uh, some productivity increases in China which, which is out of your region, you cannot do something against it. And I think the Roderick argument even fits nicely into 
uh, your your story about uh, the the um, this, um, nah, uh, this 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 this, this if, if feeling uh, feeling left behind or, or losing control, and and so I did not really understand why you why you restrict yourself by by uh, arguing that it's technological change uh, only, and one last uh, sentence and uh, then uh, I'll, I'll stop. I very much appreciate that you take these, these uh, regional inequalities into account and that you stress that macro policies tend to overlook uh, the, the, the regional inequalities. But there, and I'm not quite sure uh, um, what, 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 your, what your take on this uh, is, but in the end, your story is that we have to, to increase individuals' ability to get a good, high-skilled job, ideally wherever they live. But we have this underlying trend to urbanization that is not only driven by, by, um, by, um, by, by technological change. So, so, so there, there is advantages specifically for the service sector to being located and concentrated in cities. And of course, this creates attraction for the high-skilled people. And you, you have a couple of ideas on, on, uh, on regional policy and, and uh, they all make perfect sense, but I, I found it difficult to square those uh, two uh, arguments saying we should, should uh, improve um, the skill level also in the peripheral regions um, but we have this trend to urbanization because I don't, don't understand how, how you could stop this trend of, of high school people always moving to the cities because you have productivity advantages from the scale economies, specifically in the high school service sector, and you have this, this urban spirit and, and these amenities that will always attract the high school uh, people. But you have thought about this probably much better than I did. That's just the question I had uh, here, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you, all that. Uh, Martin, would you? Yes, th those are excellent questions. They're all the all the right questions. Uh, let me let me make one thing clear, just uh, in response to the last part of the question. Uh, when I say technological, uh, you know that includes the fact that knowledge services are now the most leading uh, uh, industry. Uh, so it may not be, you know, I don't mean to say technological in a sort of very narrow physical sense, but the fact that we don't need as many people in industry anymore, that's a technological change. That employment shifts from industry to services, I think of that as a technological change. Uh, so, you know, just so we, we don't get confused by different use of, of terminology here. So certainly there is this deep economic tendency towards urbanization. For sure, um, I want to start with it with the second part of the question. Um, as I was interested, in sort of roughly two, roughly two questions here. One is about you know why why do you want to dismiss globalization? The other is what do we do with this city periphery problem? Um, uh, you know, you you say rightly that I want to uh, equip people to have better, more high skilled, more maybe cognitive sometimes, more jobs in the knowledge services, more people should be able to have them. I, I just want to make sure that I've said clearly that it is a structural challenge. It's not, I don't want it to sound like I say, oh, you know, we just need to make sure people get educated enough, then things will be fine. It's not people's own fault in general, at least. Uh, it's a structural challenge. Uh, and these tendencies towards urbanization are structural challenges. Some of them, of course, are you know, natural. That's how you know, urbanization will increase. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the more specific aspect of the challenge is that we have an increase in inequality between regions, not just in terms of population and not just in terms of income and living standards. That's something you can, you know, the first you just have to accept people will move to the city. Uh, the second, you can redistribute to make sure that people have decent incomes in the periphery. The thing that really worries me is an increase in inequality of productivity, that the sort of things you do in the in more peripheral places falls ever further behind in terms of the market value, if you like, what the market itself rewards. Because ultimately, and, and this is perhaps where I'm not so social democratic, if you like, I don't think redistribution 
helps much with these sorts of problems. They are so big that you need to ensure that you you manage to have a, 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 you manage to limit the degree of inequality in the market rewards themselves before redistribution. Otherwise, redistribution will not be enough, or you won't be you won't achieve enough of it to solve the problems. So, uh, should we perhaps you know here's a way to put your question in a particularly sharp way. I'm not saying you said this, but one could say, and some people have said, look, we just have to accept these peripheries will decline. Let's just leave them. You know. So I don't think that is uh, either economically wise or politically acceptable. It's not politically acceptable, partly because it's it's wrong. You know, we have national politicians in charge of national communities, um, and there needs to be some policy that cares about the entirety of a country. That doesn't mean we can keep every little place alive, but it means that we need to see this as a challenge and to see are there things we can do. Uh, to counteract some of these tendencies, right? Rather than just leave things, leave the market to its own. Um, and, and more immediately, if liberal centrists don't do that, the populists will say, they don't care, we do, vote for us, and people will. And, you know, who can blame them? Uh, in fact, I think this is this was a big problem for decades that in in among a lot of the toxic stuff that comes out from some of these illiberal movements, there were some economic truths, namely that there are groups, in particular in peripheral areas, who who are being you know, who are being screwed. They are not being the system isn't working for them anymore. That has been true, and it's a good thing now that everyone is starting to say, okay, what can we do about it? Uh, because the populist solutions don't work. Uh, if we're going to fix it, we have to do it. So, what I'm proposing is that we take it as challenges for national and in Europe EU level politicians to say, well, what is it we can do? Are there policies we can implement uh, that will somehow counteract the, you know, water running downwards, as it were, which is which is kind of the economic tendency about the high value services con concentrating in cities, and I think there are. Uh, because I think to some extent, uh, it's a multiple equilibrium problem. Um, not everywhere, you know, cities will continue to win, but maybe you can have more cities, maybe smaller mid-sized cities can do better than they are now, so that you can have multiple centers, you know, so that a region doesn't get completely uh, low productivity and depopulated, but rather it concentrates within itself rather than everyone moving to the capital. That's the kind of frame uh, I want to put on it. And, and there, I think there are things you can do uh, if you manage to kind of get all the pieces in place at the same time. So you basically need to make it attractive to create some of these high value added knowledge services jobs in more places. There are things we know work with that. Um, so it turns out having research institutions tends to make it easy to create a cluster of private sector businesses around them. Um, there's research showing that, that that can work. I think you need to have a minimum of um, uh, native, as it were, demand uh, so that you have enough money going around circulating in the local economy, that you don't have boarded up shops, uh, that you don't have a lack of amenities that makes a place nice to live for somebody who can get a really nice job in the city and you know is thinking okay i'm gonna have children should i move back to the city where i grew up to be close to the grandparents you know it would be good if more people had that choice and then they will choose you know of course people will in the end choose but basically to caricature it a little bit you need to make the smaller places a bit more like the cities and that includes in how urban they feel um on, on globalization, uh, look, glo globalization, of course, it, it all interacts. Uh, but I'd like everyone to do this sort of thought experiment. You know, suppose that Western countries hadn't removed barriers to trade in the way they did from the late 80s and onwards. So do we really think that we would have had a lot more industrial jobs in high income countries? Uh, maybe a few, but I don't think so. It was the most, it, it's, let's remember that it's the least productive jobs that went, right? Because they're the ones that could benefit from low wage environments. So textile, un low productivity textile jobs, for example. They're the ones that really have moved to Asia, uh, but not high productivity, high tech manufacturing. 
that's the sort of thing that has largely stayed. And I think that if there hadn't been the opportunity to outsource low productivity employment, that would have increased rather than reduced the incentive to automate because that gives you an even, so I think actually globalization may have anything have slowed down automation and robotization in rich countries. So uh, my main claim is really, you wouldn't have made much difference to this key phenomenon of the loss of industrial jobs, even if you'd had no globalization anywhere near the scale we've had. A little bit on the margin maybe, but there are even reasons to think automation would have speeded up. Uh, but ultimately, uh, will it help to try to reduce globalization now? And I think that's where the kind of politically relevant discussion is, if you like. Is there anything we can do there? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think anything would help. In fact, I think it would probably reduce our opportunities, partly because we would become less productive. It would reduce our, our opportunities to choose some of these other policies at the national level that I think could help. So that's why I think it's important to, to defend globalization. Thanks, uh, Martin. Uh, there's one question. I don't know, um, Michael, if you want to ask it yourself. Otherwise, I can sum it up and bring it to the point. I'm, I'm happy to answer, ask it if you would like, uh, Thomas. Hello, Martin. Um, that was a great talk, and your book is, is, is brilliant. Um, I wanted to ask you, if I can, uh, also in English, um, uh, about your kind of political positioning and where the political positioning is of your of the ideas you put forward here. Um, you call yourself a centrist or a liberal, um, but the analysis in your book and your proposals are shared by many people who regard themselves on the left. And there are also some people on the right who are now talking about this kind of thing, who are acknowledging that there are very serious problems in the model of capitalism that we've had over recent decades. Um, and arguing for a stronger role for the state on uh, for greater attention to inequality and so on. And so I suppose I wanted to ask you what is perhaps a leading question for me to be asking, but interested in your view on it, which is, do you think we are going through a kind of paradigm shift in which the whole um, uh, center of gravity of political and economic thinking is changing as a result of the crises we've lived through? of the same kind perhaps as we went through in the 1940s after the crises of the 1930s and again the 1980s after the 1970s is kind of recent crises um, is that leading to a shift in economic thinking across the political spectrum of which you are a very eloquent uh, advocate uh, now is this a paradigm shift is the question in short Th thank you well I, I really hope it is uh, look i like perhaps many others uh, was dismayed that there wasn't a paradigm shift after the global financial crisis. Uh, I mean, there was, I guess, a little bit in terms of regulating finance, although even that wasn't that ambitious. Uh, but I mentioned already in my introductory remarks uh, how disappointing the recovery from uh, the global financial crisis was. Of course, in Europe, there was a double dip, uh, self-inflicted uh, second recession. And even after that, things just took very long. And in my view, largely because policymakers weren't ambitious enough or were too timid. There was, I used the phrase in the book, a sort of learned helplessness. There wasn't a willingness to rethink. Um, so I, you know, and then I found myself in the situation where when, as I was finishing the book, and of course I've been writing about these ideas for, you know, five, six years, things did seem like they were changing, even before the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic obviously has shaken up everything, but even before the pandemic, um, Thomas, you, you mentioned Biden, but think about Jay Powell and, and some of his colleagues at the Fed. The way they have changed uh, their interpretation of their mandate, their, their monetary policy strategy, very much in the direction of saying it's safe to run the economy hot in terms of demand management. We can have more aggressive demand pressure. We should do that because it can lead to uh, a permanently higher level of employment. It will bring in the people who are on the margins of the labor market. It may perhaps have good productivity effects. All of this sort of stuff started to kind of come into Federal Reserve speeches in the last few years and obviously led to that strategy shift last summer. Um, but that was already a paradigm shift. 
you know, because it's a central bank, it's sort of, it's kind of narrow. You have to be a bit of a geek to, to see it, but it's hugely important. And now, of course, Yellen is, is the treasury secretary. Uh, second example uh, is uh, the, the British Conservative Party, which has, yes, become much more statist. Remember the December 2019 election, it was about get Brexit done, and it was about leveling up, you know, very clearly politically targeting these left behind areas successfully in terms of politics. They know they have to deliver and in order to deliver, we'll see if they manage, but they're at least throwing out a lot of what was you know, standard uh, principles for a conservative government. Again, even before the pandemic. Uh, now, so, so I see this happening as you hinted maybe even more on the center right, but now in the US on the center left, in continental Europe, uh, not so much anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, although we'll see. Um, I mean, clearly European policymakers have learned from the last crisis and are not about to, uh, to pull fiscal support from the economy, but the, the moment of danger comes at the end of this year, I think, if the pandemic is over then. So we'll see what sort of change you know, you saw a little bit of it in Macron's election campaign in, in 2017. Um, so, you know, I've been seeing these shifts happening across the political spectrum. Um, myself, uh, you know, there's a reason why I don't call this a social democratic program, because there are some, some big things missing that would have made it social democratic. You know, there isn't much of a focus on redistribution. Uh, I don't particularly advocate state ownership, although I do advocate a smart role for state policy. So I think, I think the, big, the big question here is either on the center left or on the center right, is there a willingness to embrace, re-embrace a sort of uh, guiding role for the state, a sort of smart directional role for the state, which isn't the same as a bigger state necessarily um, or a more intervening state, but one that you know, sets a direction, which both the right, but also the third way center left gave up. Uh, so that paradigm shift isn't really a sort of left or right thing, but it's a, it's a role of the state uh, question that happens on both sides. I, I, it seems to be coming and the pandemic has, has really shifted it forwards because everyone has willy nearly become a radical. They just had to. Uh, and that just shifts what is seen as possible. So you know, uh, I have, I think there's good reason to hope that we're not going to snap back to the previous business as usual. Things have irreversibly changed, um, but I'm not entirely sure that that's the case. Okay. Um, we won't have the time to go more into detail on that, but as we now talked about this once or, or twice already, um, very broadly, in how much would you say uh, what Biden is doing now and already did and, and is supposed to do now or apparently doing fits to what you think is that new radical economic policy or what is the fun, a fundamental paradigm shift as Michael uh, said? Look, I, I love it. Um, and, and, and I love that it seems like this is not all of it, right? They wanted to get a doubling of the minimum wage into this package, which they didn't, but they clearly still want it. Uh, I mean, that could have been, I sort of recommend something like that, not taking credit. I don't think necessarily anyone there's read the book, but many people are thinking in this direction. They are planning, I read today, the number that's being uh, mentioned for the infrastructure package is 3 trillion. So it, it's clearly massive. Um, I think, um, I think there are, there are a couple of things uh, that have happened in the US. Uh, one is that they've kind of thrown away the timidity. And I think the pandemic has helped with that. Uh, there is this desire now to say, okay, we didn't do enough 12 years ago. If not now, when? Um, and I think there is a... a uh, sense that if you do many things at once, it is actually easy to get it through. I, I don't know how much of it is kind of philosophical because everyone says Biden is a pragmatist, the most pragmatic politician, uh, maybe even opportunistic politician you could imagine. Uh, but I think in terms of political calculation, 
they think that actually you can get further if you just throw everything at it and some things will get through even this divided Congress. It's worked with the stimulus. Um, I have a feeling it will work with infrastructure spending as well. Uh, so, so this sense that you can both do a big emergency push now and use that to try to put in place structural changes, that it is possible to structurally tilt the field, tilt the playing field in a fairer way in the US economy. That sense of possibility, I think, is new and didn't exist before. Everything before was incremental or it was compensating for change that's happening uh, anyway. You know, just to, to, to show why, <laughs> when, when Trump had his tax cut in 2017, I sort of through gritted teeth said, well, it's the, it's the worst kind of stimulus you could have. But look, I've been saying we should have more demand managed, more aggregate demand stimulus. This does it. So I can't say now because it's Trump, it's wrong. And I criticized a lot of left of center economists who had been all for more fiscal spending. And then when it was Trump, they were against it. So, so I think I've been consistent here, but I think, uh, so I welcome it. Uh, I think there is a new uh, sense that it is possible to actually fundamentally change the way the US economy works. That I think is changing the conversation everywhere else as well. In that sense, the US is still the, the soft superpower, what they do becomes possible, thinkable, conceivable everywhere else. And if it works, it will be copied elsewhere. Mm. Uh, thanks, um, very in inspiring. I mean, much to go uh, into detail and to, to discuss, but not today. Uh, and we will follow your um, comments daily, um, nearly daily. Uh, on, on how you see the things. Um, there's one question, Stefan Stockmann um, has raised his hand, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for your talk, Martin. Let me um, briefly introduce myself. I study at the relatively new Institute for Socioeconomics in Germany, and I'm with the Network for Pluralism in Economics. I have two questions and I think both more or less relate to your definition of productivity since it takes such a prominent role in um, your argument. So it, it kind of sounded to me and, and um, please correct me if, I'm, if I got that wrong that um, there's this strong link between productivity and wage wages that almost seems as if it was natural, but then you also state that, of course, um, it's the market that determines wages or the markets. Um, so markets, in that sense, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily um, see as, as, as natural. And, um, and so what, what, I, what I want to, to lead to is, um, that I, I would l love to live in a society, society where we can define productivity in a sense that also includes, um, for example, care work that is, that is now obviously not very um, um, uh, um, yeah, that, that w wages and care work when they when they are um, when it is sold at, uh, on the market, they're pretty low. So I, my first question is how how does care work relate to your framework and um, your concept of productivity? And my second question concerns um, the environment, climate, because as we def well, as we define productivity now um, in terms of um, maybe, um, yeah, production, um, 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 money value. We have the strong link between um, between production and obviously emissions. That doesn't seem to um, be uh, uh, on on its way to to be de decoupled. In, in any near future. So how does the push for more productivity relate to, 
the climate and emissions. Thanks. Martin, thank you. Thanks very much. You're completely right to ask about productivity because it's one of these concepts that are really at the core, certainly of how I understand the economy and economic policy. And it's 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 very hard to get one's head around. And and you're right, it it can capture many different things and it can fail to capture many different things. We don't have much time, so I'm going to be a bit quick. Um, of course, it's, it's not always true that productivity kind of directly feeds into wages. Notoriously in the US, we've had labor productivity go up and wages not go up. Uh, not so bad in other countries. Um, but, but I would just point out that overall, productivity is what you can pay incomes from, right? In a very simple sense, the more wealth we produce with a given amount of, of effort, defines how much we can reward that effort depending on, on our policies in the aggregate. Um, but it also goes the other way around. And I think this is really crucial. If you have to pay people well, you cannot choose low productivity ways of employing them. You would lose money, right? So in the book, I use this uh, example of, of uh, cleaning your car. Mm -hmm. You know, is it three or four immigrant men with a, with a washcloth or is it a machine? and how this is different between different countries and changes over time, what is a prevalent, um, what is a prevalent technology. So higher wages, uh, I think, tend to encourage greater productivity growth. Now, care work, you make a very good example, but, but it's not the only one. The, the more our economy is based on services of all kinds, the harder it is to measure productivity in a sort of standard quantitative sense, you know, how many cars per hour of labor. Um, but I don't see a problem with uh, adapting the productivity concept to quality. You know, higher quality for the same input is also greater productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in care work, I would like to see, for example, much more measurement of the quality of care, not just how many minutes does a carer spend with somebody in need of care, mm -hmm. but, you know, find some way of measuring that person's satisfaction and you can measure, you know, and then you can, incentivize providers, you can write up contracts, you can have policy goals based on that. And if you don't manage to increase the quality you get for the amount you spend on a care provider, then, you know, you change the care provider or you change something else. But I think I think we do need to, to think about and measure productivity of quality as well. You know, here's another example. Uh, hospitality, restaurants, right? How do you measure? Well, there is an element of quantitative productivity there too, um, but here's an element of uh, qualitative productivity. So, you know, you go to a restaurant, uh, there's a difference between a waiter who just serves a bottle of wine and a sommelier who knows everything about that wine and can tell you something about it, teach you how to drink it. That's a productivity difference, the same amount of time put in, but a greater quality service. You know, it's a small example, but I think you will find these example across services. Um, on the environment, um, I'm, a, I'm quite a techno optimist, uh, I have to say. Uh, I think on the whole, we see that the carbon intensity of production, uh, carbon intensive GDP is on the whole going down. It's not going down fast enough. But where we do force it to go down because we make it expensive to pollute, it does go down. I mean, I think the extraordinary advances in uh, renewable energy and electric automotive um, technology, just how fast things have happened, show what is possible when you put the incentives in place. So I'm, I'm originally from Norway. Uh, currently, out of every new car or every 10 new cars that are bought in Norway, six or seven are uh, fully electric or plug-in hybrids, mostly fully electric. It's entirely possible to replace the entire car fleet in a decade, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And this happened because of very strong incentive in the tax system that started about five years ago. Um, you know, with the right policies, you can change things enormously. So I, you know, we don't have time to go into the details, but in the book, I recommend very steep uh, carbon taxes across all industries and, and use those in order to avoid the... Uh, regressive social consequences, you redistribute that as a sort of basic income, um, carbon tax and dividend, they call it in the US, uh, to the population. 
so that that's one idea I would I would leave you with. Uh, many thanks, uh, Martin. Uh, we don't have any further question in the room for the moment, and I think we hit the the hour uh, quite nicely. Uh, that's the idea of this format to be quick and short, and I mean having all in, but uh, one hour. Um, I, I think your book is a real big contribution. Maybe uh, at an unfortunate time when the, the pandemic came up, uh, I suppose. I mean, it's uh, maybe a lot of people were first thinking about the pandemic. Uh, when I wrote, wrote my book on, on banking, uh, it came out at the time when uh, Draghi, short after Draghi had said that uh, now it's um, you, whatever it takes. And then people didn't weren't interested anymore in, in banking. <laughs> so for books, it's sometimes good or bad to you can't uh, plan. But I think it's uh, your book is for longer term thinking. And uh, in the sense of what we are searching for, it's, it's, I think, a very, very interesting and good contribution in the sense that it's bringing together a lot of specific topics uh, that are around. And that's what we probably need is something which covers that in the sense of a paradigm, uh, bringing things together and having an, an overall storytelling. And, and maybe we're not yet there, but your contribution is, is uh, highly valuable, I think. And uh, so we very much uh, like to, to recommend it and uh, to follow your, your further uh, developments and, and thoughts on, on this and other things. And we will um, see you back uh, at uh, our next big workshop, end of uh, May. You have already uh, confirmed uh, your participation when we're talking, we'll be talking a lot about fiscal policy, debt management and austerity. And then we will see how much behind uh, Germany still is or not. I would say we're not as lagging as much as we did some years ago uh, with the former finance ministry. But anyway, that's another topic. And thanks again. Thanks also for Robert to uh, have uh, commented uh, and brought in some thoughts. Um, this was our, I think, 10th shortcut uh, discussion and we will follow up next month with the next session. Thanks, Martin, and hope to see you back again and especially in person again, uh, not in remotely like we did now. So thanks a lot to everyone who have joined and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas and Robert and, and, and everyone. It's never enough time, but if everyone wants to, anyone wants to follow up a conversation, I'm easy to find. So feel free and contact me. Thanks very much for your, for your interest. It was a pleasure. Thank you.